And something really important. All right. All right. All of us, like, we, how many of you say, I forgot something really important this week? All right. We have a tendency as people to forget. The, the other day, uh, a couple days before we came up here, uh, I went down into our basement and I got to the bottom of the steps and I could not remember why I had walked down the steps. All right? It took me a few moments to figure out, oh yes, that's why I came down here. And just at the very top of the steps, I knew exactly right, why I was going down the stairs. But somewhere between the top of the steps and the bottom of the steps, I forgot. Right? It, that's what's going to happen to you you know, in a few years, all right? So enjoy your, your youth. But we all have a tendency to forget. It's not a, a new problem. In fact, if we, if we look at God's Word, we'd see the people of God have had a tendency to forget for a long time. Right? I, I think about uh, as God called the, the Israelite people out of Egypt and he raises uh, Moses up and he brings them out and, and he does all these incredible miracles and there's the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea and, and, and manna from heaven and the Ten Commandments. But yet throughout that story they were always forgetting what God had done and then they would complain and, and then they would feel like God had abandoned them and they, they forgot what God had done. And, the disciples, you know, the, the 12 that, that's got to spend every day with Jesus. How many of you think that would have been really cool? Anybody? Right, just to, 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 to travel with him, to eat with him, to, to hear him teach, to have conversations, to be able to ask him questions. And, and they got to see some incredibly extraordinary things. But even though they were with Jesus and, 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 and they were seeing these things, they sometimes forgot. In fact, there was a night when they were traveling across the Sea of Galilee and there was a really big storm. And they were, these were not scaredy cat type of guys, right? They were rugged guys. They were blue collar guys. Many of them were fishermen, right? They had been in storms before. But yet this storm was big enough that they were terrified. They were panicking, right? And Jesus was in the back of the boat, Asleep on a pillow. All right, I think it was my pillow, all right, that he had gotten. He just sold this advertisement anyway. Just kidding. But Jesus is in the back of the boat asleep, and they're panicking. Now, how many of you say that if Jesus was in the boat with you, you shouldn't panic? Anybody? Yes, right. If Jesus is in the boat, if the God of the universe is in the boat with you, you shouldn't have to panic. But they panicked, and they woke him up, and they said, Don't you care that we're drowning, that we're going to die? And he just was like, Come on, guys, get it together, right? And he calms the storm. We all have a tendency to forget. And as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he wants them to remember some things. And that's why he's, in some ways, in this beginning section of Ephesians, a little bit repetitive in some of his themes, right? That he keeps sort of coming back to some really key and foundational truth because he knows that we have a tendency to forget, and that we need to remember. So our word for today is remember. Remember. And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And it's really one of my favorite passages in Scripture, and so I'm excited to, to share it with you this morning. It'll be familiar to a lot of you, but I, I, my prayer is that, that the Spirit of God would allow His Word to come alive in our hearts and our minds today, and that He might reveal to us uh, what He wants us to know. And, and not just what He wants us to know, but what he wants us to do based on his word this morning. So I want us to see three key things this morning, right? Because every, every good message has three points, right? We all know that. Right? I don't know who made that rule, but it's the rule now, so we try to follow it. In fact, uh, one of my professors in uh, college, one of my preaching professors, uh, he had a, a sign, a, a, a joke on his office door, and it said the pastor was up in front of his church, and he was apologizing to him. He said, due to last week's 26-point sermon, he says, this week's sermon will be pointless. So, all right, that didn't go over so well. <laughs> Let's get to the text. The first thing that I want you to remember is remember who you were before you met Jesus. Now, for some of us, right, that, that have grown up in a Christian home and family and we were introduced to Jesus at an early age, for some of us, it, it's hard to remember. I, I, I remember praying to receive Jesus as my Savior when I was five in, in a way that a five-year-old can and understand the gospel. I was at a vacation Bible school and, and I grew up, you know, going to church and worshiping. When I was 12, I was baptized and I wanted to follow Jesus. And so, really, for my whole life, I, I, all my remembering years are, are filled with times where I knew Jesus. Maybe your story is like that, or maybe your story is a little bit different. But for all of us, 
we need to remember who we were and who we would be apart from the grace of God. And so Paul wants them to remember. So look at Ephesians 2 and verses 1 through 3 with me. Paul says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, as we look at these verses, we kind of say, this isn't the greatest news in the world. He says, you used to be dead. Right? That's sort of an interesting way to put it, isn't it? He said, you used to be dead. You were dead in what? Your trespasses and sin. Right? The Bible is very clear that, that sin causes death. Right? It was, it was what God told Adam and Eve. He said, if you... Right? And he gave them one rule. Right? Can, you know, like, you would think that they could have you know, managed to keep one rule, right? How many of you would say, I could have managed to keep... We all think we could have managed to keep that one rule, don't we? He says, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely what? Die. You'll surely die. Right? Sin brings death. The wages of sin is death. And so Paul wanted the church, he wanted them to remember, right? He wanted to remember the cost of sin. Right? He wanted them not to forget that the wages of sin is death. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. The wages of sin is death. He says, you once walked, you lived in that death. You lived in your sins. He says, you followed the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is not working the sons of disobedience. He says, if you were living apart from Christ, you were not only spiritually dead, but you were following the ways of this world, the ways of culture, the ways of society. But he says, even more than that, you were following the influence of evil, right? And sin and Satan. He says, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's not working, the son, sons of disobedience. And Paul's very clear in this letter, and we see it even as we get out into chapter 6, that there's spiritual realities going on. There's spiritual battles going on. There's a real thing called evil. There's a real Satan. There are real demons. There's spiritual battles that take place in heavenly places. And we are involved in that conflict. And so he wants them to remember who they used to be. Remember. He says, among whom we all, he says, that was all of us. You know, sometimes we tend to think of evil and wickedness and sin as being a problem that other people have. Right? Those evil people over there, or that evil thing. But he says evil and sin and rebellion was something that we all shared. Every single one of us. Every man, woman, and child. We were spiritually dead and we lived like it. And apart from that, look at verse 3. We lived that way, he says, in the passions of our flesh, doing whatever we desired, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And, you know, that, that sounds appealing sometimes, doesn't it? How many of you have ever just said, life would be really great if I could do whatever I wanted? Anybody? All right. I think almost all of us come across that thought. Like, if my parents stopped telling me what to do, right? If, if, if there were a few less rules, if I could just have a little more freedom, if I could just call the shots, life would be better. And we buy into that lie that somehow that following our wishes and our desires is going to make life better. But the, the reality is, it doesn't make life better. Because the wages of sin is death. He says, you can do whatever you want, but he says, we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. What does that mean? We were subject and under the wrath of God, the righteous judgment for sin. God is a righteous judge. He's a holy God. Right? He always punishes sin. He has to. John chapter 3, verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. You know, one of the things that the Bible is very clear about is the exclusivity of Jesus as the way to God, as the way to heaven, as the way to eternal life. And we live in a world and a culture, and you particularly are growing up and living in a culture that pushes back against that. Because that scene is narrow-minded or bigoted or, or intolerant. But I want you to know that although culture pushes back, and listen, cultures always push back against the gospel because the gospel confronts us. Right? It confronts our sin, it confronts our need, and we don't like that. It exposes us for who we are, and we push back against that. But I want you to know that Jesus is the only way. 
Right? There is no other name given among men by which we can be saved except the name of Jesus. Right? Jesus is exclusively the way to the Father. Jesus was crystal clear on that. You know, there are things in the Bible that we wrestle with. There are things that, that are not always particularly clear and we have different opinions and we, 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 we think through those and that's good. But there are some things that are absolutely crystal clear. And one of those things is that Jesus is the only way to the Father. Right? It's an exclusive message. Right? It excludes those who reject him. But for those who receive him, it's amazing. So Paul, he wants us to understand the bad news so that we'll get the good news. Because if we forget who we were, if we forget what we are apart from Christ, we lose our gratefulness, we lose our love for people who don't know Jesus. Right? Our, our lives ought to be filled with love for one another first, but then for people who don't know Christ because they're lost, they don't know Jesus. Right? And, and we don't look down on them for not living according to God's ways. You know, one, one of the things that we've not always done a good job is sometimes we look down on people who don't live like we do, and yet we say, well, they shouldn't live like we do. They don't know Christ. And we lose our perspective on the beauty and the power of what Paul says next. Look at verses 4 and 5. As you consider the second thing that we want to remember, remember what God has done for you. Right? And again, these are basic things, but these are so important. It's so important not to lose sight of these things. He says, but God. So he gives us this incredibly bad news, right? He says, we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. And we, followed, you know, we followed evil and wicked influences and the ways of this world. And he says, we were by nature subject to God's wrath. But then look at what he says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love for which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. Right? So he, he gives us this incredibly bad news, and he says, but God. Right, that, that's one of my favorite little phrases in the Bible. He says, but God. But God what? Being rich in mercy. Right? We've talked about grace being given something that you do not deserve, but mercy is the withholding of something you do deserve. Right? And by nature, by, by all of us, we deserve God's wrath. Right? I do, you do. We've all rebelled against our Creator. None of us are righteous. None of us are good in and of ourselves. Right? None of us. But he says, but God, being rich in mercy, and listen, because of the great love with which he loved us, right, out of God's incredible love, it says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive, right? Something changed, something happened when we came to Christ. He says, we were made alive. He says, for by grace, you've been saved. So there's mercy and grace for us. He says, God is rich in mercy. And this, this remembering this is so important. Right? We need to remember what God has done for us because if we do, it changes how we look at life. Like if I live remembering that I used to be dead, that I used to be cut off, that I used to be separated from God and His love and His grace and His mercy and His goodness, but now He's revealed His Son to me and by faith I've received, and we're going to get to that in a moment, and, and I have life now, and, and I have mercy and grace. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates His love for us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? Don't, don't lose the, the personalness of the gospel. Right? Christ died for you. He died for me. Don't lose sight of that. He says, even when we were dead, God demonstrated his love for us. He died for us. And you've been made alive. You know, it's something we ought to never get over. You know, sometimes there, there, there's moments or seasons in our life where we, we realize this and there's an excitement and there's a joy, but sometimes we forget. And so Paul wanted the church to not forget, to remember the glorious realities of the gospel, the grace that they've received, that Jesus had absorbed the Father's wrath on their behalf. He never wanted them to forget the cross. He never wanted them to forget what had taken place, that Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Son, absorbed the Father's wrath on your behalf and on my behalf, that he took the punishment that you and I rightly and justly deserve so that he could give us life, so that he could make us his children, so that he could adopt us, so that he could redeem us. Look at verses 6 through 8, or, or through 9 actually. It says, And he raised us up with him 
and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and in kindness towards us in Christ. Verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the free, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Right? He reminds them just of the simple beauty of, of the gospel and what it's done for them. He says he's raised us up with him. He, he seated us in heavenly places. And there, there's, a, uh, there's a reality right now that even though you're sitting in this room right here, that in Christ, in your spiritual position, you're already seated in heavenly places in Christ. Right? Because God who exists outside of time can see the end from the beginning and all of that is, is, is just different for him. Right? We, we, we see everything is happening in a, in a very linear way, but, but God exists outside of time. And so right now, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you're in Christ, you're seated in the heavenly places in Christ. And he says, here's the reason, verse 7, he gives us the, a purpose clause, right? So that in the coming age is what? He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. For all of eternity, our salvation will bring God glory as we are objects of his grace. Right, as it becomes obvious for eternity how gracious and merciful he was and how his grace saved us and redeemed us and we will give him glory and honor. And he just, he reminds us, he says, it's grace that saves us through faith. Right, you know, as we've been looking at Ephesians, it's very clear that God's the author of our salvation, that, that we wouldn't reach out to him if he didn't reach out to us. But it's also very clear that God requires a response from you towards him. Right? Jesus demanded a response of people. And all of us have a personal responsibility to respond to Jesus. Right? You can't be neutral with Jesus. You know, in our world today, a lot of people are like, I, I like Jesus, or I like some of his teaching. No, you, you can't like Jesus. Right? You either recognize him for who he was, or you reject him. You either recognize his deity, you either recognize his glory, his love and his grace and his mercy, or you reject him. Jesus made it very, very easy for us to do that because he was very, again, exclusive in his claims. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so, Paul wanted them to know, God has saved you. And in verse 6, he says he saves us to himself. Right? In verse 7, it says he saves us for himself. Verse 8 and 9, he saves us by himself. And we need to let the beauty and the glory of that be something that we never forget. Right? Never forget what Jesus did for you. I love what the hymn writer said in an old hymn called Rock of Ages. He says, Not the labor of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me Savior, or I die. We should never ever get over what God has done for us. Remember who you were. Remember what God has done for you. And then number three, and I want us to focus in on verse 10, remember why God saved you. Remember the purpose for which he saved you. And yes, to bring him glory, but Paul's going to bring in a, a focus now for our life here. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is one of my favorite verses. Right? If I had a life verse, it would be this verse. I love the beauty and the truth of this verse. And, and, and more than anything this morning, if you remember anything from our re message on remembering, remember this verse. It says, for we're his workmanship. That, that word in the original language is a word from which we ultimately derive our English word poem. It was used in that time not just of, of sort of poetry but of artwork. And so it's this beautiful picture of your identity, of how God sees you. And so I, I want you to see that knowing that you used to be dead but God made you alive and he seated you in heavenly places and he, he saved you by himself and for himself and to himself. But I want you to see what that means for your life right now. What that means for your life today. What that means for you when you go home. Not that any of us want to think about that right now. Right? We want to put that thought off as far as we can. 
But I want you to see what this means for your life. You are God's masterpiece, right? Uh, the New Living Translation translates that word as masterpiece, and it's a, it's a good way to look at that word, right? Now, how many of you would say, I've never really thought of myself as a masterpiece? Anybody? Right? When, you know, when I look in the mirror, my first thought is not masterpiece, right? My first thought is, wow, I'm glad I don't have to see that for the rest of the day, right? <laughs> right? We, we sometimes, when we look at ourselves, we don't see masterpiece. And I don't know how you see yourself. I, I don't know how you look at yourself. Maybe you struggle with identity. Maybe you struggle to see your value and your worth. This morning, I want you to see the way your Savior sees you. I want you to see yourself the way He looks at you. And I want you to know that He looks at you with eyes of love. Did you, did you catch what He says? That, that He loved us with this incredible love so much that He gave His Son, that He died for us while we were still sinners? Right? A love that gave a Son. Right? I've shared this with uh, in, in years before, but you've seen my kids and, and, and I, I love them so much, but I wouldn't, give up any, I wouldn't give up any of them for you. You know? Does that make sense? Like, it came down between you and my kids. I'm going to choose my kids. Are we clear? <laughs> but I, I would, I, I'd give my life for you. If there was danger, I, I would put my life in front of your life. But I don't know that, I'm just being honest, I don't know that I could put my child in between you and danger. I'm just, I'm just being honest. But that's exactly what your Father in Heaven did. He gave His Son for you. And He looks at you now as His child. And He loves you. And He calls you Masterpiece. He says, you are some of my best work. I made you. I shaped you. And he made you just the way he wanted you. Right? All of your characteristics and traits, your looks, your, your voice, your talents, your abilities. Right? All of them were shaped by your Father in heaven. And he calls you masterpiece. He says, you were created in Christ Jesus. Our spiritual position. He uses that phrase over and over again. What? for good works. So here's the thing. You're not a masterpiece that he just wants to set up on a shelf for everybody to look at. You're a masterpiece that he wants to use in this world for his glory and for his purpose. I want every one of you to understand that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. God has a plan and a purpose for you. And I don't want you to ever forget that. And that might seem so basic. That might seem so obvious. But I know from my own life and dealing with others, that we can sometimes forget this. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And your identity is to be shaped in how God sees you, right? Not, not, not the approval that other people give you, not, not your talent, not your abilities, right? Not how well you're doing in school, not what position you got in orchestra, right? Not how many likes you got on Instagram, right? Some of you. Right? We, we, oh, we measure our worth. We, we compare. No, your worth comes from Christ. Your worth comes from the God of the universe who made you and who loves you and who died for you and who calls you his masterpiece. But he says he saved you so that you can serve him and fulfill the purpose that he has for you. And it's my desire for every one of you. Listen, I believe God loves every one of you, that he died for every one of you, that he wants every one of you to know him and to experience what it means to be in Christ by faith through grace. Right? He, he wants you to know that and experience that. But He wants to use your life in a great way for His glory in His kingdom. And so I want us to just think for a moment a little bit of how do we do that. Right? Because it's sort of easy to talk about. Right? It's easy for us to, to be in here and say, you know, that's great and that sounds good. But, but how do I live that out? And so I just want to give you three really simple things to do. But really important things to do to live out your purpose. Number one, surrender your life to God daily. You know, I so wish that we could surrender our life to God once and that would be enough. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great if we could all just decide here this morning that we're going to give our life completely and totally to God, right? And we're going to live for Him and His glory and His purpose forever. Wouldn't it be great if we could all just agree to that? Anybody think that would be great? I think it would be great, but the problem is we are living sacrifices and we tend to crawl off the altar sometimes. Have you ever noticed that? that? That you make promises to God and, and you want to serve God, but then you find yourself drifting from that commitment or that purpose? Right? So surrendering your life to God is, is not just a one-time thing, although there can be moments of surrender that mark you forever. Right? And, and when my time as a camper here, that, that was the beginning of 
of some surrender in my life. God was calling me to surrender some things, and I started to, but it was a process. And so surrendering to God is something that we have to do daily. What does that mean? It means that I remember the price that God paid for me. Right? I remember that I used to be dead. I remember that I was dead in my sin. But that God made me alive and that my life belongs to Him. That He purchased me. That He redeemed me. And so I wake up in the morning and say, my life really doesn't belong to me today. So I want to surrender it to God today. God, here's my life. Take it and use it for your glory, for your purposes. Surrender your life to God daily. God will honor that prayer. Number two, seek God's direction. Right? We all need direction in life. Now, it'd be great if God just sort of you know, sent us a text message every day right, with instructions. You know, and some of you were talking about college choices. It'd be great if he just sent you an email, right? Here's where you go to college. How many of you would say life would be easier that way? Right? How many of you realize that God's not interested in making life easy? Right? Why? Because he wants us to walk by faith. But so how do we seek his direction? Well, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 say, Trust in the Lord, what? With all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Right? In all your ways, put him first. And he will what? Direct your paths. Right? In, 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 a, in a very sometimes mysterious way, as long as we're seeking him and putting him first, God will direct you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll prompt you. He's more than capable of getting you where he wants you to be. Aren't you thankful for that? That if we're living a life of surrender and we're living a life of seeking, he will lead you and he will guide you. You won't miss his will for your life. And number three, serve God right where you are. You see, it's not a later thing that you're to do. Serving God, living for Jesus is something he wants you to do right now. Right? The clearest way to find God's direction is to serve him right now, right where you are. In your context, here, of course, at camp, but when you go home, in your church, in your community, in your home, serve God with the gifts and the talents and the abilities and the desires that he's given you. And think, if we do these things, if we live a life of surrender and seeking and serving, right, God is going to use our lives for the purpose for which he created us. He says, you are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. Right, works don't save us, right, we're saved by grace through faith, but the works are something that happens after our salvation, right? Once we know Christ, we're his masterpiece, and he wants to use our life for his glory and his purposes. And so I want you to remember. Listen, when life is hard, I want you to remember. Remember you're his masterpiece. Remember you have a plan and purpose for your life. When you fail, remember you're a masterpiece. And God doesn't see you any differently than he did before. And he still has plans and purposes for you. When you struggle with your identity, when you struggle to feel worthy, remember God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You're his masterpiece. Remember the price Jesus paid for you. Remember God has a plan. I, I want all of you to live for his glory and to live for the purposes that he has for you. And, and I, I really want you to just be open this morning and say, God, if, if you want whatever you want to do in my life, God, here it is. It's yours. I'm your masterpiece. Use me however you want. I love the words of the hymn, Living for Jesus. It says, Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call, to follow his leading, and give him my all. Living for Jesus wherever I am, doing each duty in his holy name, seeking the lost ones he died to redeem, and bringing the weary to find rest in him. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to you. For you, in your atonement, did give yourself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be your throne. My life I give henceforth to live. O oh, Christ, for you alone. What would happen if that was your prayer this morning, would you bow your heads this morning? And just in a moment of reflection, I just want you to take a moment to remember what you were and would be apart from Christ, apart from his grace and his mercy. Remember what he's done for you. Remember the price that he paid for you. Remember what he's done. But then remember that you're his masterpiece. You are beautiful. You are thoughtfully made and designed. You are loved by your Father. And He has a purpose and a plan for your life. 
And I want you to, to be willing to surrender to that plan and to seek His direction and to serve Him with all of your life. And just with our heads bowed and eyes closed, how many would just say this morning, just say, you know, I've, I'm really maybe in a place where I'm struggling just to understand my identity in Christ. I, I'm struggling with the way I see myself. And I just want you to pray for me because I want to see myself the way God sees me. And I'm struggling with that. Would you just raise your hand so I could pray for you? Anybody struggling with that? Thank you so much for your courage. And I want to ask you another question. How many would say, I sense God calling me to surrender something to Him. Maybe there's just something, some plans or, or some dreams, but He wants me to surrender something. I, I really believe it. Would you pray for me? Anybody else just raise your hand? Thank you, so many of you. Let, let me pray for you. Father in heaven, we bow before you this morning. Father, I thank you so much for this incredible group of students and counselors and staff and faculty. Father, I thank you for the, just the incredible privilege that we've had to be together this week. Father, it's been such a blessing to me to just be around these fellow believers and to be refreshed and encouraged by them. Thank you for that. But Father, I thank you that right now, in this moment, there are so many that need your touch. And Father, I believe you desire to touch them. Father, I pray for those who just need to understand and, and, and have a spiritual awakening in their identity. And Father, I know myself, I've struggled with that. So I just pray for each person who needs to see themselves the way you see them. Father, may they see themselves as a masterpiece. May they see themselves the way you see them. May they believe what's true about them. And Father, may their identity be forged in Christ and may it shape how they live. And Father, for those who, who feel called to surrender something, I pray that through the power of your Spirit, you give them the faith to surrender that thing to you today and tomorrow and the next day, that they might live lives for your kingdom and for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.